Yeah, so this is a joint work with uh, Maria Pina Limoncelli, um, Leni Chassi, and Gerda Lombert. <clears throat> um, the intention of our work is to give an overview um, on methods for uh, vibration-based damage assessment. It's a non-exhaustive uh, overview, of course. Um, and here we only talk about methods uh, for damage indicators, uh, damage detection, damage localization, damage quantification. Um, but we don't talk about um, the structural performance assessment that should follow then uh, afterwards with the information from, um, from the damage assessment. Um, so we've identified, well, three classes of methods, which are data-driven methods, um, which work only on uh, measurement and vibration measurement data from a reference and a damage state without having a finite element model available. The second class of, model, uh, of methods is uh, model-based methods, uh, where we do uh, the analysis on the damage based on a finite element model. Then we have combined data-driven and model-based methods, which are situated uh, in between of them. So they take data-driven features um, strongly and um, confront them to a finite element model. And in all these uh, methods, uh, we have to take care of the influence of uh, environmental uh, and operational uh, conditions that are changing in the time. So the first uh, class of methods are data-driven methods, uh, where we only have our um, measurements available at the sensor positions in the reference and damage state. So to get a um, good resolution also for, um, uh, for identifying damages, um, yeah, we need to have uh, many sensors. So, and the main challenge here is to extract damage sensitive features from the, from the measurement data. So we extract some features in the reference and in the inspection state, in the damage state, and uh, yeah, do some kind of um, measure for um, uh, the indication of damage. So there are uh, many different uh, methods available. Um, some are in um, frequency domain, some are in time domain, um, <clears throat> and some are even time variant uh, methods. Um, some, some tools or some um, indicators that we get from the data or typical indicators are uh, natural frequencies. So basically uh, everything is linked to the modal parameters then um, coming from, um, from the measurement data, from the vibration measurement data. So a standard indicator is uh, the modal frequencies uh, uh, that can be used for the detection of damages. Um, further features are uh, the mode shapes um, that are identified uh, and the derivatives, so like curvatures, and that can be used uh, for localization. Then we have other uh, features derived from, um, yeah, from the modal parameters like modal flexibility and the derivatives um, that can be used to detect uh, losses of stiffnesses. Um, and so on. Um, so with these uh, methods, uh, well, we need um, a good uh, grid of sensors to be able to have uh, some precision and some assumptions about the structure itself uh, for, um, for uh, being able to localize damage, but in general we can't do quantification with these methods. Um, one example of uh, methods is um, um, a method using modal curvatures um, that are uh, more sensitive to local, local uh, stiffness reductions, but they always have the problem of uh, differentiation uh, or getting the curvature from, from the data is a difficult task because um, uh, we have noisy signals and the derivation is uh, ill-conditioned. Um, so here an uh, interpolation method was used um, that interpolates the, uh, the modal curvature and takes the difference between uh, reference damage states in order to, to localize um, damage. Um, the second uh, class of methods are um, model-based methods. So with these methods, we have a finite element model available uh, of the structure in the reference state. Uh, we update it with measurement data from the reference state. We update it with measurement data from the damage state. And we compare uh, or we get the damage information then from the differences between the models. Here, this is illustrated um, with the example of the Z24 bridge, where uh, one column was lowered. Um, as a damage um, scenario. So there were some cracks in the girder that, uh, that appear. And here we see the modal parameters in the, in the reference state um, and in the damage state, where we can clearly see a drop in the frequencies uh, between both, um, both states. Um, so this information is then used to update um, a finite element model, where damage is then uh, identified through the updating uh, of this model, assuming that it leads to a local loss um, in stiffness. So some damage functions were used then to have a parameterization of the, 
uh, of the damage. <clears throat> Um, so here we can see uh, some results. So on the right side, we see the, the banding stiffness that, that was updated uh, in the reference state in blue. Um, that was updated with the, damage, uh, with the data from the damage state in, in black. And from the difference between both, um, we can see that damage uh, really happened in this, um, in this area. And it was found out that um, yeah, stiffness reduction was up to 30% um, in, this, in this area. Okay, so then the um, um, third class of methods are combined data-driven and model-based methods um, that we looked at that are situated between data-driven and model-based approaches. So with these methods, we use data-driven features um, that are extracted from the reference and uh, from the damage state. And then we confront it to a finite element model or using some information from a finite element model, um, but without updating the model parameters. So instead updating, we define some damage indicators that are linked to the um, elements of a finite element model. And we um, define some statistical distance measures uh, from the data um, yeah, to, the, to the model in some way. In this way, um, often the problem of damage localization and quantification is also treated separately, uh, which improves the uh, conditioning and reduces ill positiveness of the, of the methods. And we also have a chance with these uh, statistical distance measures um, to get damage indicators that can be uh, automatically um, computed. So here's just um, a little example, a little illustration. Um, so in the reference state, we have some vibration measurements um, that are used to, um, to build up a data-driven reference uh, model. Uh, we take uh, into account the uncertainties um, in the data. And from the finite element model, we use some information um, <clears throat> On the, on the structural parameters. Um, then in the damage state, um, with new vibration measurements, um, or new vibration measurements uh, are directly used to compute uh, damage indicators for, uh, let's say, the parameters of the model in some statistical tests. And um, from this information, then we can see uh, where um, damage uh, happens. But first, we don't know how much damage is, is there. So in a second step, um, quantification um, of the damage can be done then once we know where uh, damage is located. Um, so in all these uh, methods, um, yeah, the environmental influence uh, takes a big part and I will give over to Eleni. Okay. So, um, for my part, I, I want to introduce the, a topic that has been mentioned throughout multiple presentations so far, and this is the influence of environmental and operational conditions on the response of the system, which often uh, prohibits the correct, uh, uh, let's say, a precise uh, assessment of structural performance. And uh, here the topic or the problem at hand is uh, basically uh, that of identifying performance in a long-term sense, uh, where we're interested about the effects that might be evolving in a slow scale, uh, such as deterioration, uh, accumulation of fatigue, and so forth and where the influence of external acting agents such as temperature, wind, waves, uh, depending on what type of system we're looking at, um, hinders uh, the, the precise uh, detection of uh, damage. And in uh, coping with uh, such a problem, there has been a multiplicity of methods that have been developed, although I have to uh, say they're not at the stage where they are standardized as uh, methods that uh, act on a short-term scale. And so, for instance, Operational model analysis is already quite advanced, as Alvaro pointed out, and uh, standardized in the sense that tools are readily available for uh, uh, addressing the problem of ambient response, therefore having a broadband input and just measured outputs. But the issue of uh, additional influences, uh, such as uh, the ones uh, I'm uh, referring to here, is not so uh, automated or uh, uh, standardized at the moment. Uh, the classes of methods that can be identified for incorporating these effects are roughly here categorized into the so-called multi-model approaches, functional models which try to, let's say, extract a model that incorporates the influence of environmental and operational conditions, or feature extraction, which tries to extract features and track how these evolve under these influences. Only as an example, I'm showing here a method uh, uh, developed by our group uh, at ETH Zurich, which uh, uses the uh, probabilistic, let's say, information collected from both input and output data, input in the sense of temperature, humidity, or traffic uh, information that we might have on a system, 
an output in the sense of a quantity that is, uh, let's say, measured, such as frequencies, or even more uh, uh, complicated, let's say, response quantities uh, that are characteristic or provide evidence on the performance of the system. What we try to extract is a functional representation of the output uh, with respect to these inputs, uh, which then allows us to uh, predict what is the influence of uh, the operational environmental and environmental conditions on the response, and therefore reliably in the second step uh, detect outliers and potential damage. Now, uh, this is just an example of how this method would be perform in the case, here you see the case of the Z24 bridge addressed just, uh, explained just earlier, uh, where uh, this framework works in two stages. You have a training stage where you have the so-called original system, either this is healthy or this is your reference system, where you train your model, uh, and this would be uh, what you see here on the left of this vertical line. Uh, and uh, we then have the ver verification or the validation case uh, where you're uh, trying to predict the response of the system. So in green, you see here the predictions of the model for the period of time when this bridge was undamaged. And then uh, in, uh, and in blue is always the, the reference or the measured uh, estimates. Uh, of the uh, performance of the system. Here, natural frequencies are used as the output quantity, and you see here the clear indication of damage in the deviation of prediction from measurement, which you can further quantify uh, in a clear, uh, clear, let's say, damage index uh, element. Uh, the same process can be generalized for other types of systems. So here you see the same process or the same kind of index produced for a wind turbine structure. You see on in the red uh, the interval in which we train the model and in green the prediction, where we always try to have a, an index lying within some specified thres thresholds. One step further, uh, you see here some recent work, uh, work by uh, uh, the group of Keith Warden in the University of Sheffield, where we try to classify the performance of these indicators by segregating into uh, regions. Given that we work with training sets, then there is of interest uh, to see which kind of uh, data is actually conforming to the uh, data set we already have gathered, and this would be region three that you see here, where the input lies in the known area of collected data and the output is conforming to your prediction model. You might have the case where you have new kinds of inputs, meaning, uh, for instance, intensities of wind that lie outside the data set you have collected so far, but again, you have a model a response or model prediction that is conforming to the uh, original, uh, to the model that you have, we have put together, the stochastic model put together. Or you might have uh, regions like the blue one uh, that you see here or the red one, which uh, uh, are not conforming to the model prediction and which could either be attributed to, uh, first of all, an area where new input loads are acting on your structure, and therefore response, although not conforming to the one, to the predicted one might be something that is not necessarily damaged and needs more exploration. Or you might have a region where a uh, known input is producing uh, an, an, out an outlier in the output, and this is something that might be indicative of uh, damage. Um, that being said, uh, the the advantages of this approach is, first of all, that they are, let's say, uh, applicable to a wide range of systems. Uh, so it could be a bridge system, a wind turbine facility, why not a, a marine uh, riser or a dam structure. Uh, but the disadvantage is that they really operate, uh, in this sense, in the first damage assessment level, and that is the level of detection. If you want to move to the levels of localization and uh, quantification, then uh, exploitation of the spatial information from a grid of, sen of sensors is important, and additionally, uh, the fusion of models of the system, as mentioned uh, before. Now, the application areas, I think this is known more or less to uh, most of the audience uh, members here. Uh, in the cases where we have uh, components, components of machinery, in mechanical or aeronautical engineering, these methods are actually more widely applicable and this also has to do uh, with the scale, the fact that these methods are uh, applied within the context of, context of testing, and so you have actually controllable environments. The issue in uh, larger infrastructure, and therefore in civil uh, structures, is the fact that you, we're dealing with larger scales. In this uh, sense, one has to justify increased costs of uh, potential sensor grids and a fusion of different sensors. Uh, and 
uh, what is more, we're uh, uh, also uh, um, dealing with systems where it is not so easy to have uh, implementation cases. We're not we're no longer in the uh, in the context of a lab, but actually in uh, in working environments. And therefore, there has been a lot of criticism and a bit of hesitance from uh, the industrial, let's say, the operator side in adopting these methods. And so, in the context of appraisal, critical appraisal, I will mention here some advantages and limitations of the methods. First of all, uh, with respect to the damage features that are employed and were mentioned earlier, when uh, using model frequencies, there are features which are uh, really not providing uh, spatial information. Advantages are, of course, of course, the ease of implementation and the fact that you can automate the method, uh, but you will not receive information on a local level, and so localization uh, and quantification is hardened. This is a bit easier if you use model shapes and derivatives or uh, operational shapes and derivatives because, of course, the information of the spatial grid comes into play. Uh, but then there's uh, the issues of sensitivity to the changes, uh, to moderate changes or to the noise of the instruments and so forth. With respect to the methods that were uh, overviewed by Michael uh, just before, we have the data-driven methods which are quite fast and so you can already uh, incorporate them within an automated uh, monitoring framework, but usually they lack the possibility to very easily quantify damage. You have model-based approaches which are most commonly applied offline, so you cannot really do it in real time as the data is obtained. And more recently surfaced, but still in development, somewhat combined methods that could uh, bring together the best of, uh, let's say, both worlds. Overall, uh, in linking this to the objectives and the scope of this action, uh, I think it is important to collect what is already existing in the state of the art, so what methods are actually already applicable, and I think Alvaro did a great job already showing some uh, automated frameworks that have been deployed and are operational. What methods are, uh, could be accelerated in development in order to, uh, to reach this level of maturity, and what are the methods that we are potentially not so far addressing and could be uh, developed to, uh, uh, to let's say, satisfy uh, the requirements of the operators and uh, those leading management and maintenance schemes. So uh, you can find this uh, information summarized in the respective fact sheet, and we wait for your inquiries and uh, suggestions. <laughs>